This program is made possible by the generous support of the Josephine S. Leiser Foundation, a charitable endowment that proudly supports quality programming on South Florida PBS. A normal school day descends into chaos. A former student opens fire, leaving 17 dead. Parkland, South Florida, and the nation are left reeling. Join us now as we look for solutions on mental health, school safety, and gun policy. In Parkland, The Way Forward, a community conversation. Hi, I'm Pam Giganti. Thank you so much for joining us for this South Florida PBS community conversation, Parkland, The Way Forward. We all know the tragedy that led to this discussion. 17 students and teachers dead after a former student armed with an assault rifle shoots up Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. While the county, the state, school board and others launch investigations into how this happened, Tonight, we're focused on finding solutions. We're breaking this conversation up into three parts, mental health, school safety, and gun policy. This interactive conversation is focused on civil discourse and in an effort towards full transparency, we're taking our questions tonight via Facebook. With that, I wanna welcome our online audience via Facebook Live. Through our partnership with the South Florida Sun Sentinel, Digital producer Emma Kate Austin is joining us here in studio to take questions from our online audience. We'd like to take a moment to recognize a few guests joining us tonight. Christopher Maddox, language arts teacher at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Psychologist Mindy Cassell, co-founder and CEO of the Children's Bereavement Center. Mindy has been working with students in the aftermath of the shooting. And finally, we have local students from our partnership with the PBS NewsHour's Student Reporting Labs. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Joining us, we have Superintendent of Broward County Public Schools, Robert Runcie. State Representative and MSD graduate, Jared Moskowitz, a Democrat serving Coral Springs. Chair of the Broward GOP, State Representative, George Moritis. Legislative Chair of the Florida PTA, Angie Gallo, and School Psychologist and Chair of the Crisis Management Program at Miami-Dade County Public Schools, Frank Zaniri. Mr. Zaniri has also been working with Broward Schools after Parkland, and he helped in Newtown following the Sandy Hook shooting. First up, we talk gun control. The parents and students of MSD turned their grief into action pushing lawmakers in Tallahassee for changes to state gun laws. It took just three weeks from the tragedy occurring to Governor Rick Scott signing the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act into law. You work for us! You work for us! MSD students and parents got some, but not all of the changes they wanted to Florida's gun laws. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Safety Act includes the following gun measures. A jump in the minimum age to buy a gun from 18 to 21 years old. A three-day waiting period on gun purchases. A ban on the sale of bump stocks, those attachments used to make semi-automatic rifles fire faster. And police will now be able to temporarily seize the guns of anyone being held for an involuntary mental health evaluation or Baker Act. Still, the biggest item on the students' wish list, an outright ban on the sale of assault rifles, did not happen. Nor did a ban on high-capacity magazines that can hold as many as 100 rounds of ammunition. And to begin our discussion on gun policy, I'd like to begin with Representative Moskowitz. Thank you again so much for joining us tonight. This is your community. You went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. These aren't just victims, these are your neighbors. These are people you care about. Clearly you went back to Tallahassee with new resolve. You wanted to get something done. Let's talk about the legislation and do you think it was enough? Well, I don't think it was sufficient. Uh, but I think it was necessary. 
Uh, and I knew when this happened that we had three weeks left in session, which was different than Pulse. Yeah. Uh, when Pulse happened, we were not in session. Uh, and in fact, when they polled the legislators to go back in the session, the majority of them said no. Uh, and so I knew that there was this limited window. Uh, and so the first thing we did was, as we brought down the Speaker of the House and the Senate President, they needed to see this uh, for themselves. Uh, they needed to see what a school looks like when there are bullet holes in a window. They needed to see what the hallway looked like when people are running out for their lives and where, unfortunately, people uh, didn't uh, make it out. Uh, and then I knew that because of the compressed time frame, that actually would apply pressure that is needed in order to accomplish something like this, not where there's eight weeks and there's so much time for all of the special interests to interfere uh, and disrupt the process. Um, so while we did not get an assault weapon ban, which I am for, uh, and supported several times in the amendment process, uh, this was the largest piece of gun control that has passed the state of Florida in at least 20 years. In fact, it's the first comprehensive piece of legislation on gun control that even came to the floor of the House for a vote. Uh, I mean, you're not, it's not just about taking guns out of the hands of people who are under 21. It's not just a three-day waiting period, but the red flag restraining order a law that's in there, in the Baker Act and outside the Baker Act, has already been used. Uh, there was already a case in Lighthouse Point in Rarid County uh, where a gentleman uh, clearly who should never have been able to buy a gun said all sorts of crazy things and when they came to his house when the police were called and they found an arsenal of weapons he was Baker acted and his weapons were taken from him. Uh, we'll never know what that prevented uh, but the law is already working uh, and so while there's more to do uh, we took an inch and we'll come back and we'll take another inch. And that's what this whole movement that these students have started. And these parents who should have been grieving became lobbyists. Uh, and so we'll have another crack at it in Tallahassee uh, because we have no choice. Washington is doing nothing. We talked about gun control for two days and then we started talking about aluminum and steel and we've not gone back to the gun control debate. We have a question right now from our Facebook audience. So let's turn things over to Emma Kate with more on that. Yes, um, so Sue Ann R. says, given that states and countries that have more guns have more gun deaths, shouldn't the priority be to reduce gun ownership? And she was directing that question to you, Representative Moraitis. Well, thank you, Pam. And, and again, I, I wanted to just say that, uh, you know, a lot of us really grieve for the families in Parkland. And, um, you know, Representative Moskowitz is to be commended along with many others that went out there and really helped those families. I myself did a little bit of that. Um, Again, just because we were close and we, I just really felt led to do that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the gun control and, and what we can do, I, I, Representative Moskowitz, I think he's understating a little bit about how significant these reforms are. Uh, they were, I think in, in, in our minds, or at least in my mind, the most important thing is to make sure that uh, people who are mentally unstable and are a threat to others don't have access to weapons that can cause destruction. And so that was really accomplished uh, in, in two facets. One was, uh, through the, uh, the Baker Act, and there's people who are mentally incompetent now will have their weapons taken, and law enforcement can petition the court to take weapons from people who are having mental difficulties and are a threat to others or themselves. And that's already been used, as Representative Moskowitz said, and I think that's the most significant thing we could do in terms of gun control uh, in this case. As far as reducing the amount of guns and would that help, <clears throat> there are so many guns out there that even if you agree with some reasonable regulations like we've done, uh, that in itself will not uh, secure a school. And I think it's important to understand that when we say we're going to protect a courtroom, our solution is not let's go out and take everyone's guns. When we say we're going to secure an airport, our solution is not let's go out and take everyone's guns. And so I think we have to look at this as let's make some common sense, reasonable steps. We don't have to make it easy to obtain these types of weapons, but there are a lot of uh, law-abiding law citizens that want to have access to these guns for self-defense. We saw right after the tragedy, the students went up to Tallahassee immediately. And then we all saw the picture of that one student who became very emotional when it wasn't even debated on the floor of the House to ban uh, assault rifles. You're not for a ban. <laughs> Talk to us about that. When, how do you defend that to people? And what is the reasoning? Okay, I defend that because people have a right to self-defense. As I've told a lot of the students and I met with them and, and spent a lot of time with them explaining this, that you know you can disagree with the Second Amendment, but we do have a Second Amendment in our Constitution which guarantees people the right to bear arms. The Supreme Court has held that. Uh, we should not just allow criminals to have the most uh, potent uh, types of rifles and handguns. 
The, um, so again, it's a matter of self-defense for a lot of people. Uh, the answer to a mentally unstable person doing something like this is not to say, let's take everyone's guns, and, and nor is, is there any appetite to do that, to seizing people's weapons. Um, so I would just say that well, given that, um, that's why I don't support it. I do support what we did, and I'd even go a little bit further, uh, perhaps even like we do with class two firearms at the federal level to make it more difficult to obtain these high capacity uh, and powerful weapons. I will say that a, a normal hunting rifle doesn't differ that much from an AR-15. So we start to say, let's take this away, and then the last tragedy in Maryland was committed with a handgun. I think sometimes we look too much to the assault weapons and say this would solve everything if we would just get rid of assault weapons. And really, there, there are lots of th ways that people, unfortunately, can, can maim and kill other people. All right, and we're getting another question now via Facebook as well. This is directed to you, uh, Mr. Zanieri. And go ahead, Emma Kate, what is the question? Uh, Jorge O says, why is it so difficult to identify people with mental illness and let gun stores see this information? I'm sorry, and let gun, <coughs> gun stores see, see this the information. information. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with certainly internal workings of the law and what they're permitted to do and not to do, registering as well as being known to local authorities if those have used weapons in a way to crim uh, in a criminal manner. Uh, in those situations, of course, it is known. But as far as background checks and getting into the details of that, that certainly is not my area of expertise, so I don't want to go out on the limb and say something that's not quite accurate. Superintendent Runcie, I want to bring you into the conversation about this because you and I have talked about mm -hmm. guns yes. and you said there's just too many guns out there. Yeah, well, what I would say is that the United States has about 5% of the world's population, but we have 40% of the guns in the world. And that's concentrated in a smaller percentage of, of the country. So the, the question's got to be, do we really need that many firearms out there? Um, access to... Representative Moraita's point, he mentioned a shooting that happened this week in Maryland. Uh, two lives lost there, uh, I think three. But the fact that it was a handgun versus a semi-automatic weapon proves the point that we really don't need these semi-automatic weapons. They will actually save lives. Uh, there's no place, I believe, in civilian society where that can rationalize the, the ownership and use of um, semi-automatic rifles. Um, this is not about uh, taking away guns from folks. I, I believe in this country, folks have a right to bear arms. That's part of our constitution. Uh, but having weapons of war um, that can do the kind of destruction that they're doing, um, we've got to have more sensible, common sense gun reform to be able to stop these kinds of atrocities from occurring in this country. Representative Moskowitz, comment on that. No, the, the superintendent is correct. Um, uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and I think Repre Repre Representative Moraitis is making the philosophical argument. And so from a philosophical standpoint, we, we can agree from an academic standpoint. But in the, rea in the reality, in the logical standpoint, AR-15s are not meant for hunting. Lately, they've been, they're, they're being used to hunt children. Okay, uh, they're not meant to go out and hunt a dove. That's not what they're for. Uh, and when you talk to even NRA members, okay, they will tell you they don't need an AR-15. And just by not allowing an AR-15, that doesn't infringe upon the Second Amendment. Right. You can't go buy an automatic weapon right now. No one's, no, there's no campaign going on right now to legalize automatic weapons because that's an infringement upon their Second Amendment. A at the end of the day, it's about how much damage somebody could do. It's not just the AR-15. You take the AR-15 and then an extended magazine, or the AR-15, the extended magazine, and a bump stock, you now have a weapon made that should, it's in for Afghanistan, not for the streets of America. And so this is just about, it's about logical, realistic, practical discussion about what should be allowed to be bought. Um, and it's just, that's part of the problem is that in my assessment, I think the NRA is no longer representing their members. I think the NRA is representing the manufacturers. Uh, because when you talk to people, uh, people who are NRA members or people who are hunters, you will find that they're for background checks. They're for universal background checks. 
but we can't get that accomplished for some reason. The background checks we have are just criminal background checks. If someone's on their Facebook right now and they're posting all sorts of things on their Facebook that they want to commit all sorts of atrocities, they want to do this, they want to do that, we don't, that doesn't get checked. They're telling us, these kids are telling us what they want to do on their social media and yet we don't even look at it. Representative. Well, Rice. again, I would just say there's been some good points made. Again, we can all certainly disagree on that. Politically, it was not going to be achievable to do anything like that. And I would just say a lot of people in this country, not just in the legislature, have very strong feelings about the right to defend themselves. And to say that a criminal uh, should have a better weapon than someone can have to defend their home with is, is just unacceptable to so many people and, in many people's opinions, is unconstitutional. So. Do either of you see the opportunity, though, looking at these weapons? And there's so many of them in different kinds. We were comparing assault rifles with hunting rifles. Could you see limiting the purchase of certain types of weapons? Would we have to name them specifically in the law? How could that, could you see something like that happening? Uh, we, we looked at that, and, and it, it turned out that it was very difficult to start naming all the different weapons. And again, even some pistols have a, a, a sort of a semi-automatic capability. And, and so it, it got into the point where we just decided to say all firearms are going to have a three-day background check. And again, that gives law enforcement a chance to intervene. Again, the mentally um, ill people, that, that's, that's another aspect of it. But just simply saying all law abiding citizens that want to use these weapons should not have access to them. It just is unacceptable in many people's do you, opinion. Do you agree with Representative Moskowitz's commentary about the NRA? I, I really don't in, in that sense. I mean, again, the NRA did not support the bill. I don't know if that was that's, that's come out or not. But they were very strongly opposed, particularly to the 21 age requirement. But again, a lot of us just felt that this is a, a common sense thing we can do. That's been the law for handguns for years. Why shouldn't it be the law for the, the, uh, the, the other types of weapons, the rifles? I'd like to bring in our teacher, uh, Christopher Maddox, if you will, and give us your opinion and, and commentary on what teachers are saying. What are you hearing at school from teachers, from parents, from students related to guns? Um, a lot of what we're hearing is, um, as you might expect, people calling for assault rifle bans. Um, <clears throat> this, let me say this, um, this is all a kind of an academic conversation until you hear an assault rifle go off in a place where it has no business going off. It'll shake everything that you thought you believed in ideologically or however. So a lot of teachers, um, even teachers who lean more right, and it's a shame we have to bring that up in this type of conversation, but even teachers who lean more right after the experience that we had are, even they are like, you know, maybe we can do something to 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 limit access to those those weapons. Um, and that's really been the conversation around school. Um, everyone I, I think I've spoken to feels that way. There was no way we could have come out of that situation and still been, uh, well, you know, laissez-faire about it, you know, live and let live and all of that. To hear those gunshots in that setting, you know, it kind of sealed the deal. How are all of you doing collectively? Um, this week was a particularly tough week. We had a couple of security incidents that um, we had been doing well, um, at least on the surface. Surface of the waters were calm. Um, but this week kind of disturbed that a little bit. Um, teachers who were actually in the building are still having a difficult time. Um, one of my coworkers, and I just was talking with her the other day, she was sharing with me that this past week was the first week she had been in on the campus and not smelled gunfire mm. or gunpowder. Um, <coughs> people ask me that all the time, how are people doing? And we say we're doing okay because, you know, but the truth of the matter is there's a lot of stuff going on yeah. at the school with the students, with the administration. Um, our administration has been doing an excellent job, and you can see it in their faces there. You know, they lost 17 kids on their watch. Yeah. And that <laughs> we all did. It's not administration, it's not security. No, they are all our kids all the time. So there's no time when we're on campus and when you walk past that building where you don't say, you know, I can't believe this happened. Yeah. So it's tough and we're trying the best we can. Um, the love from the community has been fantastic. 
Um, we have an army of care dogs on campus, which has been great. Yeah. The students respond so well to that. And I was a cynic when it came to stuff like that until yeah. I saw it in action. Um, so we appreciate the love from everyone. It's just, it's going to take time. Oh, you know? yeah. And we thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much. And now to the issue of school safety. MSD is a school of 3,800 students and multiple buildings spanning several city blocks. All were protected by one student resource officer, a licensed Broward Sheriff's deputy. While much has been debated about his actions that day, having school resource officers on campus is seen by many as a key deterrent to violence. Under the new MSD school safety law, Florida's public schools will divvy up over $98 million to improve the physical security of school buildings. That means adding things like steel doors, upgraded door locks, and bulletproof glass. The state allocated almost that same amount for additional school resource officers. The new law requires at least one officer at every public school and one officer per 1,000 students at larger schools. The most controversial part of the law is the $67 million set aside for the Coach Aaron Feiss Guardian Program to train and arm some school staffers. Coach Feiss lost his life protecting students at MSD. And under this voluntary Marshall Plan, counselors, coaches, and librarians would be allowed to carry guns, but not classroom teachers. Teachers across the state, however, have widely pushed back on the idea of being armed. And now for more on school safety, I'd like to start with Superintendent Runcie. Let's talk about the amount of money that has been put towards this. 97.5 million for SROs statewide, money for active shooter training, 98.9 million to improve schools, physical school safety. What does that mean to you as a superintendent? What does that look like at a school? Well, first, uh, let me certainly uh, applaud the legislature for getting 7026 passed and providing additional dollars uh, for school safety. Uh, it's not enough, but it is a, it's a good start. Um, it will allow us to put more school resource officers um, out into our schools um, and be able to provide the additional protections um, that we need. Um, so we're gonna work through that. There's a piece there for 98 million for um, school physical security measures, uh, but that is gonna be a competitive grant process. And what we have to do in Broward and are embarking on now is doing a security risk assessment of all our schools in Broward County, complete that by August. Um, the applications to compete for this grant money is they're due in December, and it is my understanding it'll be awarded in the first quarter of 2019. So that's not really gonna have an impact on a district uh, until probably the 2019-2020 school year. We've gotta put things in place now. And um, some of the things that we, we're doing now is to um, make sure that just having good habits and behaviors in the school and enforcing protocols we already have in place, single point of entry, make sure the gates are always closed. Um, make sure that classroom doors are always locked. Uh, make sure that the folks that are monitoring the campus are doing that with a high degree of, of uh, vigilance uh, around the campus. Um, we are also completing our single point of entry projects. So every school in Broward County, uh, by the end of this year, no later than the first quarter of 2019, will have single point of entry. That's limiting the way in through fencing and, and door systems. Uh, we're upgrading all of our camera uh, security systems. Uh, that will be done by June uh, of, of this year, uh, making sure that's in place. Uh, we're continuing to do our code red training, which we do at all our schools. That is the foundation for active shooter. And we are enhancing that for our middle schools and our high schools. We're putting a new curriculum together to be able to launch that going into next year. Some specific things around Margie Stoneman Douglas and I issued communication out to the community today uh, because the last you know, 24, 36 hours um, have been unacceptable in terms of what we've seen in terms of some security lapses. Um, so I had a conversation with the governor. He's, he's sent out communication and he's going to help 
provide additional support through Florida Highway Patrol. So we're going to be able to man um, every gate um, at the school uh, during the school hours and for after school activities. Um, we will also be implementing a program with clear backpacks for all the students starting after um, spring break. Uh, we are also going to funnel um, students and visitors uh, to some uh, confined points where we're actually going to wand folks like you would see uh, in airports and so forth, uh, similar to what you would do it's like around metal into a detectors. Stadium. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. basically like going into a stadium, yeah. the same type of thing. So we're going to really beef up and enhance security measures at the schools. That's what the community wants. That's what the faculty needs to see because people need to have a clear sense that everything that is possible that we're putting in place. Um, so we're going to go a little bit overboard, but I think the situation requires it at this point in time. I want to bring in Angie. We were speaking earlier, just to remind everybody, you're the legislative chair for the Florida PTA. Yeah. You have your pulse on what parents are saying in schools. Talk about this sense of security. Parents want something done now, just kind of like what the superintendent was talking about. Yes, so yes, parents are concerned with what's happening in their schools right now. Um, and as Superintendent Runcie mentioned, there's a timeline. So there's assessments that have to happen, and then there's grants, and then they're going to get funded. And most of the changes that we see won't come until the 2019 2020 school year. And parents are concerned. They want to know what is going to happen now. And I commend Superintendent Runcie because it sounds like he's put in a plan and I encourage and hope that all districts across the state are doing that same type of assessment and putting in a plan. But parents want to know now what that plan is, what their districts are planning on doing. Um, how are they going to keep the kids safe? Are they doing the risk assessments? Because I hear from parents, parents are on the front lines, they're on the front lines with the teachers. Other than the mm -hmm. teachers, they're the next point of contact at schools. They're in these schools. And they're telling me, Angie, the buzzer doesn't work. The, the camera's not working. There's a lot of things, a lot going on right now that could be easy fixes that districts need to look at and need to be doing. And they need to be transparent with parents as much as they can be without giving away plans because we, right. we don't want to make schools in danger. We understand that there's got to be a protocol in place. But we need to have open communications with our community. Parents need to know what the plans are. Kids need to know what the plans are. We heard a lot from students um, after Stoneman Douglas and they're like, we didn't know what to do. We didn't, we don't have active shooting drills. And I know several students called upon uh, legislature to put that in the bill and it's in the bill that now we have active shooting drills. Um, there's gonna be an app in place. There's gonna be certain things that are gonna happen. As parents, I think we're worried that they're not going to happen quick enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see a lot of PTA stepping in, and we're concerned from the PTA perspective that PTAs are going to start pulling out their checkbooks, trying to get those schools hardened quicker, um, make those schools safer, quicker, and um, we're concerned about the function and the role of the PTA in that because we do have guidelines with our 5013C status, our nonprofit status. Because that's not necessarily the well, PTA's role, And it's role, not our right? job. Right. And, yeah, and right. we shouldn't be paying for something that the legislature should be paying for. And that will work really well in affluent neighborhoods, but then what What about our other schools? Well, we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to create an equity issue. We don't want to have disparity among schools. All children deserve to be safe. And as Superintendent Runcie mentioned before, you know, we have this great bill that gives us mental health funding, that gives us the hardening of school funding, and we're so thankful for that. Um, we are a little discouraged with the with the per student funding that came out, the 47 cents, which is our flexibility within our budget for, <laughs> for our students. And we feel like our kids deserve to be safe and a high quality education and our teachers deserve raises. So we're a little disappointed with some of the funding structures in that. Um, but yeah, we, we would like to see that timeline accelerated if at all possible. All right, we have another Facebook question. Go ahead, Emma Kate. Thanks, Sam. Isabella S. says, how can we help our teachers be better prepared in case of a school shooting? Superintendent well, uh, Runcie, you want to take uh, that one? Uh, I think absolutely we need to continue to do what uh, we're doing at Broward. We, we need to continue to have um, code red training. Uh, which we actually conduct with the staff. Those are followed by actual drills in the school. Um, so what uh, we will do is to make, and they go on throughout the course of the school year. Um, what I would like to see happen is for those to occur in the beginning of the school year so that everybody's prepared um, at the onset of the, of the school year and, and that um, we're you know, diligent in making sure that that happens. It's a, it's a little easier to do that at the elementary schools than it is at our secondary schools but it's something that absolutely has to be done um, and really give our um, <clears throat> teachers and our students uh, the, the skills to uh, do what they can to protect themselves 
uh, to the maximum extent possible. Let's talk about the SRO program. Mm -hmm. We saw the SRO not go in at MSD. We've all seen that video, and I think right. we were all stunned that he didn't yeah. go in. Mm -hmm. The sheriff said he was supposed to do that and engage right. the shooter and take out the shooter. Now in Maryland, just this week, we did see the SRO take out the shooter. How do you feel about the SRO program and what needs to be done to make sure that these officers are well trained and do what they're supposed to do? Uh, well, look, a couple of things. First, this whole situation that we have this contrast in SRO should, should really speak to the challenges of trying to arm teachers, right? Uh, that's, there's a whole really different level of skill that I believe that you need in order to be effectively use firearms to be able to, to defend and protect the school. We need highly trained um, individuals where there's clear expectations of what it takes to become a school resource officer. These can't be jobs that you just go to and you know, you're near the end of uh, retirement or it's an easy job to go to. No, these are the most important jobs in the community, keeping our kids and our schools safe. Um, so there needs to be a high bar for somebody to actually get into one of these roles. Uh, they need to be adequately tra uh, trained. There needs to be accountability and monitoring and, and so that they're able to go and execute well and that the community has confidence um, that they can do their job. Um, I would say on large campuses like Stoneman Douglas, uh, one school resource officer is, is not sufficient. And so consequently, we will have probably a dozen or more um, on this site, uh, but we need to come to some standard. I think it's a good start to have maybe one per every thousand. So some of our larger schools will have three or four, mm -hmm. maybe even up to five. But again, it's not just about quantity, it's about quality. And we got to set clear expectations. The school administrators got to hold them accountable and the agencies that they come from, whether it's been from the municipality or the Broward Sheriff's Office, it's got to be very clear of what we're looking for. So then how do you feel about this Aaron Feist Guardian Program that the legislature <clears throat> well, pushed through what is now law? What, so what I would say to you is that the Marshall Program, as it's also referred to, is we need to make sure that we have trained law enforcement personnel sufficient numbers on campuses. In my view, when we start talking about arming school staff, uh, to me that's saying, look, we don't want to invest the resources to get the real trained law enforcement people that we need on our campuses. We're going to put another burden on school staff, not pay them appropriately, and move on to like the next session. No, that doesn't work. If we're really serious about solving this problem, hardening our schools, let us get highly trained, experienced, effective law enforcement personnel. That's all they're doing for a living. That's all they're thinking about. We want our teachers to focus on books. We want them to focus on kids and giving them the skills they need to be successful and not worrying about um, firearms. And then the whole logistics of having firearms in classrooms and schools, just introducing more problems. guns there. Yeah. What, what happens if there's an incident going on and, and a teacher is shooting and actually hits a student? Where's the liability come in for that? There's so many unanswered pieces. Look, this is not the Wild West. These are our classrooms. We've got our precious kids and, and, and our hardworking, diligent teachers there. We need some real solutions that are practical and, and not creating again, Wild West scenarios in schools by putting more guns. And you were nodding your head. Yeah, Go I, ahead. As, as the PTA fought against having that portion of the bill, we, we asked for the Marshall Program to be removed. The, the majority of parents that I've spoken to do not want guns around their kids. I've had parents tell me they will remove their child out of any school that, that a teacher is armed. I've had teachers tell me they'll quit if there's teachers that are on campus that are carrying a guns. It's just something that most parents feel vehemently against that type of program for many of the reasons that they mentioned. We personally would like to see that $67 million for the Marshall program go for school resource officers. Yes. And we have concerns about school resource officers um, do we have the personnel to fill those positions? Because I know in my county, we have real concerns about being able to find the personnel resources to fill the 166 positions that we need. So what's, what's our plan? Like, what's our plan to fill those positions? Those are some of the questions that parents have. Yeah, and, and, and I, yeah, I, just wanna, I just wanna add something. I mean, let's be clear. The Marshall Program, the Guardian Program, whatever poll-tested word they wanna <laughs> name it, it's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible idea. Uh, but let's also say something, and, which is why they named it after Aaron, who I graduated with. He was an unarmed coach who ran into that building 
and he's a hero, and he gave his life to save students. When the SRO didn't take up a position, didn't run in the building, he hid in the stairwell. The video shows him hiding in the stairwell. Those students depended on him to protect them, and he failed. And so what the superintendent is talking about is, I don't care if we have five or 10. If they're just not going to do their job, whether it's one or 10 of them, then the, the program doesn't make any sense. And so I, I think the superintendent hit on it. I, I do think that there was this idea that this was the retirement program, mm -hmm. especially in a city like Parkland, which is the, the safest city in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a failure. It was a complete an utter failure. The fact that the governor now has to come in to provide officers to secure the school is another failure. Why does the governor have to send <laughs> FHP and FDLE to Broward County to protect one school? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you got officers falling asleep in their car. Uh, this is outrageous, okay? And the parents I, I talked to, they thought that after this happened, Oh, Douglas is going to be the safest school. There's no question. There's going to be 100 officers roaming Douglas because that's the obvious, most practical thing. Didn't happen. Happened for a week, and then they disappeared. Uh, and so, listen, the city thanks the governor for stepping in and providing leadership there and sending the officers. They thank the superintendent for coming up with these new innovative ideas like clear backpacks and wanding. People think, well, that's going to be inconvenient. That's taking some rights away. I can tell you in my town, they don't care right now. They want to know that when their kid's learning history, or they're learning geography, or they're learning about government, that they're safe. Uh, and so I support all the things the school board is doing. But, but let's be clear, I hope the governor lives up to his promise when he signed the bill in which he said he was looking forward to moving the $67 million out of the Aaron Feist Guardian program into the SRO program. And he's communicating that to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Bob. No, and I was saying to Representative Moskowitz's uh, point, the governor's communicated to me, to me as well that he will do that. Um, so I, I sincerely hope that that comes to fruition. Go ahead. Pam, let me just say a few things. First of all, there's been over, there's been 17 school shootings in the United States in the last few months. So this is not an isolated problem. And I, I completely agree that we need to get some of the best in our schools protecting them. So school resource officers is a great idea. When it was introduced a few years ago, it wasn't without controversy because of the idea of guns on campus. But again, as we saw, you know, when the answer to somebody shooting people is, is not to just have an unarmed person throwing their body on someone, as courageous as that is, it's to have someone that has a weapon to be able to take them out as it happened in Maryland. Um, as far as, you know, how we fund that, uh, the, the funding of schools has always been a shared state and local responsibility. So the state is stepping up in a tremendous way with hundreds of millions of dollars to provide more school resource officers and training. Um, each jurisdiction, each county, each superintendent, each sheriff has the choice whether to participate in this Guardians program or not. Um, if they choose not to participate, that's fine, then they're gonna have to find the resources in the community for more police officers. And that's it's great and that's encouraged, but for some of the areas that perhaps don't have the resources, this is a viable option for them to take, take advantage of. Yeah. Can, Quickly. Yeah, just a quick thing about the school resource program. So the way it works in Broward is Broward County pays somewhere around forty-seven, forty-eight thousand dollars um, in partnership with a local municipality or the Broward Sheriff's Office, and they, they cover the other half. So the dollars that we're receiving, yeah, under the same model, we would be able to add a lot of school resource officers, but we gotta recognize that this is gonna put an additional financial burden on the municipalities, and they're gonna have to agree to the other piece. It's not just a one-way street, okay. and so that's gonna present a challenge in terms of meeting it. All right, that has to be the last word on that. Turning now to mental health, the one thing we know about the Parkland shooter was that he was a young adult in crisis. Police had been called to the family home 18 times over the past decade for behavioral issues. Superintendent Runcie has hired an outside firm to audit the shooter's journey through Broward school system from elementary school until his time at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. But he is not the only child in crisis. The Association for Children's Mental Health estimates that one in five kids under the age of 17 has a diagnosable emotional, behavioral, or mental health disorder. So in large high schools with 3,500 students, as many as 700 kids could be in need of mental health services. Right now at schools across the nation, the ratio of students to a school psychologist is almost 1,400 to one. Here in Florida, that ratio is higher, with almost 2,000 students per school psychologist. 
but there will soon be more money for kids and mental health. The MSD High School Safety Act adds $90 million in funding for student mental health services. And we begin our conversation now on mental health with Miami-Dade school psychologist Frank Zaniri. Let's talk about this funding that's going to go now towards mental health. Is it because we need more counselors, more boots on the ground helping these students? You're in crisis management. You've been doing this for 20 years plus. Yes, we absolutely need more. Uh, we don't have nearly enough of the school mental health professionals to address the concerns that you just heard. When we talk about 20% of our nation's school-age youth having an identifiable mental illness within a given school year, in Miami-Dade County Public Schools, that would account for about 75,000 children, most of which we have not identified as needing the help and fewer yet that are receiving it. So we do need to have more counselors, more school psychologists, more school social workers, and even more importantly, they need to be allowed, be allowed to do what they do best. We should not have counselors teaching academic courses instead of counseling children. That's a must. School psychologists and school social workers with the many other things that they offer in their skill set also can provide mental health services. Uh, many years ago, I had a conversation with the former superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools where Columbine High School is located. And this was just prior to school opening after the shootings at Columbine. And she said something of great wisdom to me. She said, you know, that first day back, I can surround the school with the National Guard, with all the local police. My students and my staff would feel perfectly physically safe. But psychologically, that's gonna be a long road back. And this is where I see, of course, in a tragedy of this magnitude, the value of having those mental health resources in place, not just at the moment of crisis, but long term, we've learned from these unfortunate events around the country that up to 50% of students and staff exposed to the most acute phase of these types of events will suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. And some of them, at least 50%, will still be dealing and battling with it three years out. We've also seen that even those Columbine students now in their late 30s, mm. A number of them have debilitating anxiety and depression to the point they cannot hold down a job. Now, that doesn't mean that has to happen with the students from Stoneman Douglas. Uh, the resources are out there. Uh, the collaboration between the school mental health, community mental health is absolutely key. And if we work it from the angle of parent, home, family, mental health agencies, school mental health, and we triangulate all of that, then we have a much more greater chance to have wraparound services that will support children as well as our adults that are serving those children. We have another Facebook question. Go Sorry. ahead, Emma Kate. This is related to mental health. Mm -hmm. sure. Linda M asks, what procedure do we have to deal with troubled students at school? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a variety of ways we do uh, deal with this. We certainly can work with them as far as a classroom setting and going into classrooms and working with teachers with interventions. Uh, we can have them work directly with counseling professionals, whether it be the school counselor, psychologist, or social worker. Uh, we have meetings, child study team meetings or student support team meetings, they're called differently in different districts, uh, where we bring in all of the players at the table the family, the student, the mental health professionals, the instructors, administration, and we problem solve. We try to identify what is impeding the progress of that child in being successful in school, whether it be academically, behaviorally, or socially, and work it until we resolve those problems. We work with the resources we have available to us, and if it is something grander in scale that we don't have sufficient resources, we tie into our community partners for more intensive work over a longer term. I wanna go ahead and bring in Dr. Mindy Cassell from the Children's Bereavement Center. Mindy, tell us about uh, this new funding allocation that's coming from the law and how you're hopeful that it's going to be uh, used for you getting some more uh, ref people being referred to the Children's Bereavement Center. Yes, when mental health funding was cut, we saw a dramatic decrease in the amount of referrals to the Children's Bereavement Center. We know that one in five children, 
are suffering a loss by the time they graduate high school. That does not even include a tragedy with the magnitude of what has happened here in Parkland. So we are hopeful that as schools are staffed with mental health professionals, we can partner with them to provide the much needed resource of long-term support as long as a family needs and family-centered support so that everyone in the family can work together to help the child or each other. Give us some idea of what your organization does for children who have lost a loved one. And this can be a cousin, a grandparent, anybody in their circle that they're suffering the loss of. Yes, we do not discriminate on type of loss or who died. Whoever is important in that child's life who is significant, we welcome them to the Children's Bereavement Center. And we see children and family members from age four on up, and the whole family attends. And children are in developmentally appropriate age groups with their peers. And what the group does is create a perspective. It gives an opportunity for children to be together with other kids and not feel so alone that they've had a loss. And not only to reduce that isolation, but when whether it's a child or an adolescent or a parent or a caregiver, when someone else in that group says something that validates your feelings, that's important. So even if you can't articulate your grief, you can look at it, you can talk about it. And what we've seen is that group is a very powerful support in helping people adjust to loss. Mm -hmm. And this is an adjustment process. It takes a long time. It really does. People need the opportunity to reflect on their loss, to be able to control their feelings and have, have the opportunity to take the pain that they're experiencing and bring it out on the table and share it with others. Well, and Angie Gallo, I want to bring you in on this a sure. little bit. Let's talk about what parents are saying. I mean, I think perhaps before this conversation on mental health, we focus so much on money for academics and making sure that our students were reaching uh, a, a certain level at, at a certain point. Uh, in their academic career, but we weren't talking a lot about their mental health. And if you're suffering, if you're suffering from a loss or your parents are getting divorced or something's going on in the home, it's hard for you to concentrate as a student. So talk a little bit about what you're hearing from parents as it relates to mental health. Um, you know, we hear a lot about academics and yeah. I think we've, we've seen this shift over the last 15 years towards uh, a hardcore push on academics and we've seen some of the other things go the wayside. And to mention to his point about guidance counselors and mental health counselors, we don't have mental health counselors in every high school. We don't have guidance counselors in every high school. And when we do have them, especially in elementary schools, which is where we need to pinpoint the kids, those are the kids that if we get them early enough and we intervene, and I'm no expert, but we get to those kids soon enough, we know that we can make a true difference. We can imp be impactful on that child. Those guidance counselors, they're in lunchrooms, they're in car duties, they're, they're walking kids from one class to the next. They're not able to do what they need to do. And I was fortunate enough to sit at the round table with Governor Scott right after the tragedy. And um, one of the top um, guidance counselors said, when asked, how much of your week do you get to spend with kids? She goes, just with kids and not mm -hmm. do anything else? And, she, and they said, yes. She said, maybe one day, but probably not even a full day. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have a full day where our guidance counselors can devote to these children. So I hear frustration from parents. I hear frustration that they're not getting their needs met, that these kids are stressed out, that it's too much, that they're over-tested, that they're overworked, mm -hmm. um, that they need more breaks. We need a more holistic approach to, to how we teach our children, and we definitely have to pull in that mental health component so that we can make sure that we're getting kids the help they need sooner. Yeah. Superintendent yeah. Runcie, speak to yeah. that. I mean, you've got guidance counselors and doing other jobs. There's just not um, enough people yeah, in the, the school. There's the, not enough funding to hire more teachers, the, there pay them what they deserve. There aren't enough resources. Um, we've got to do a better job investing in uh, public education, I think, especially here um, in the state of Florida. Um, there's been some movement over the last several years, but we certainly have um, a significant ways to go at $7,300 per student in Florida when a national average is over $11,000. Um, it, it's a struggle. Um, we've done some analysis on this, and that's absolutely correct. Guidance counselors have been doing a variety of things. And so what we started um, a couple of years ago, recognizing that they were spending maybe half of their time in our high schools doing anything else but what their job profile indicated they should do. Um, we, and one of them was actually test prep. Uh, and test and test support and administration. So we um, we actually hired test coordinators 
a lower level role to be able to take um, some of that off of the guidance counselors so they can spend their time doing what we actually hire them uh, to do in schools. You know, I, I will say this whole topic of mental health is something that needs to come to the forefront of public education. Um, the scope of what we have to do in public education has changed tremendously. We cannot properly educate students unless we deal with a lot of the um, social, emotional, and mental issues that they have come to school. There's something near maybe 50, 60, or 70 percent of children in this country suffer from adverse childhood experiences. We got to be able to recognize that and put supports in place so that we can get them in a position to learn, to be able to figure out how to cope with the challenges that they're, they're facing. Um, to ignore that, we do that at, a, at our peril. So we've got to rethink public education and recognize that these are resources that need to come into our public schools. We need to create a continuum of services outside of the school day so that there's adequate supports for that. We have another Facebook question and then I'll get to you, Mr. Zanieri. Go ahead, Emma Kate. Alejandra R. says, as a parent, I want to know what are some of the signs of mental sickness in teenagers and where can I go to find out more information on how to deal with that? Dr. Zanieri, go ahead. Okay, there are many types of mental conditions that certainly have their own symptoms along with them, and those can certainly be looked into online. The American Association, the National Association of School Psychologists, American Counseling Association, certainly the American Psychological Association will give you a complete listing of the variety of illnesses along with the symptomology that goes along with it. Um, I would like to add, though, in terms of mental health and mental illness, and we've heard some excellent commentary about the value of social-emotional learning and developing social-emotional intel social intelligence, basically. Uh, so children can grow and learn to navigate through the years in a way that they can reach their maximum potential. We heard about adverse childhood experiences. Years back, several years back, the Sandy Hook Advisory Commission came up with some data and some interesting facts about mental illness and its relationship to homicide, specifically gun homicides. They found that only 5% of all gun-related homicides were solely due just to mental illness. The other 95% had to do with a multitude of other factors. But four or five other factors they did find contributed heavily to these types of events. One, at least one childhood trauma, an inability to regulate your own behaviors and emotions, one, a positive social connection to an adult, at least, substance abuse, and access to a firearm. That was the conglomeration, so to speak, of ingredients that led children or troubled youth to unfortunately follow through in a very angry and horrific way in some cases. So whatever we can do to catch a broken child before they become an angry adolescent and a young adult who spouts out at the world in a really negative way is all the better. And the programming that we need to get in place has a lot to do with it. I want to bring in one of our students. Daniela Link, if you could stand for us, please. She's also one of the students who participates in our student reporting labs as we partner with the PBS NewsHour. Tell us a little bit about what your fellow classmates are saying related to this whole issue and perhaps in particular to the mental health issue. Do you have friends who are going through things and sometimes they find it difficult to talk to somebody about what they're going through and it affects their academic performance? Well, I think a lot of students at my school right now are it's actually great. We're being super involved. Like We're really understanding what's going on. We're paying attention. We're keeping up. We're participating in the walkouts, the marches. We're trying to keep the conversation flowing in our student body. Um, it definitely is an issue, mental health. A lot of people, it is a conversation that happens like at the lunch tables or like you hear people whispering about it in the back of the class, but like not really a lot happens with it, I guess. At my school, I don't really know I personally don't really know what the procedure would be if I were to hear about a student like hand dealing with an issue like this. So I think it's really great that we're talking about it, that hopefully this is something we can implement in all the high schools and yeah. And I know that you were the one who spearheaded the walkout when all of the students walked out of school on March the 14th, the month after the shooting happened in Parkland. Tell us a little bit about what that was like as a student body to come together. Yeah. So. 
as soon as the tragedy happened, as soon as the tweets started coming out, as soon as the walkouts and marches have started to be planned, I knew right away that like this had to happen at my high school. I, I wanted it to happen at every single high school across the entire world. I really did. Um, so it was really great. I'm a part of the student government at my school, so I was in a good position to be able to make this walkout happen. So the student government and all of the class officers from every single class, from the freshman class and the senior class, um, we came together and we, made, we scheduled a meeting with our principal, our vice principal, and our activities director to make this happen. They were very open to hear to what we had to say, which was super awesome that they were really understanding and allowing us to exercise our rights like that. So we made a plan to have all the students walk out to the field, walk across the parking lot, and walk around the field for 17 minutes to honor the victims. And it was also a great thing because as much as we wanted to protest and show that students won't be silent sitting in classrooms, we really wanted yeah. to honor the victims yeah. as well. Thank we really you. wanted to mem remember them. So as we were walking around the field, we had someone in the commentator section. They said yeah. bios, they read off the students' names, and yeah, it was, a, it was a good moment. Thank you so much, Danielle. We really appreciate it. And that's all we have time for tonight. We hope that you'll stay engaged with us on Facebook and we'll continue to follow these issues on our weekly public affairs program, Your South Florida. We hope that you will check it out. And as we say goodbye this evening, I want to thank our media partner, the South Florida Sun Sentinel, and we want to say a special thank you to the Josephine S. Lizer Foundation. Its generous support made this evening of community conversation possible. To our panelists and to our audience, both in studio and online, we thank you for being with us tonight. South Florida is MSD strong. Good night. This program is made possible by the generous support of the Josephine S. Leiser Foundation, a charitable endowment that proudly supports quality programming on South Florida PBS.